If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Or trusted to the saints, dedicated to giving Christian answers. And now, from the studios of KIXL Radio in Austin, Texas, here are your hosts, Lee Meckley and Jim Tungate. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus Christ is speaking, and he says, I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. This is Christian Answers Live. I'm Lee Meckley, Director of Radio Outreach for Christian Answers, along with Jim Tungate, who is our Director of Research and Editor of the Christian Answers Journal. And we'll be uh, talking about that publication a little bit later on in the broadcast. Uh, Jim, welcome back. You, uh, <laughs> we missed you last week. Yeah, I decided to take a night off since we were having the debate, and it really wasn't necessary to be, for me to be here since it was mainly the two gentlemen that we were spotlighting. So glad to be back this week, though. Okay. You know, Jim, I uh, went to visit my parents during the uh, July, speaking of taking some time off, I went to visit my parents during the July 4th holidays, and uh, I hadn't seen them for a long time, so we had a lot of catching up to do, and I found out that the Jehovah's Witnesses had come to see them. Mm. Now what's so amazing about this is where my parents live, which is literally out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they have to go into a small town nearby to pick up their mail, and the express package services, despite what they say on their commercials, are rarely able to find my parents' place, and so things usually tend to pass my folks by, except for Jehovah's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Witnesses. <laughs> now, Obviously, one has to take one's hat off to any group that has that kind of dedication. Uh, but what's more, these people are witnesses, witnesses for Jehovah, the God of the Christians. Uh, they come to your house with Bibles in their hands, and they offer salvation from the wrath to come. So, listeners, what's wrong with these uh, zealous young people? Uh, can you, the listener, tell what's wrong with them as they talk to you, or do they sound just the same as your pastor does on Sunday morning? Well, today we're going to be dealing with just one point at which this so-called Christian group teaches something totally different than what was entrusted to the apostles and preserved in the pages of Scripture, something upon which your salvation and my salvation stands or falls. Now, I'm referring to a piece of literature which Jim Tungate has in his hot little hands that has been widely circulated by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, otherwise known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, entitled, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Now, this uh, piece of literature boldly claims that Jesus Christ was and is not God in the flesh, and that the Trinity is a product of pagan influences on Christianity in the early centuries of the church. And, of course, naturally, they would also tell you that his death on the cross does not pay for your sins, and that salvation, your salvation, rests on your shoulders. Can you demonstrate from the Word of God that they're wrong? If not, you need to listen to the show today. Our guest is Rob Bowman, Jr. He is uh, an instructor in apologetics and theology at Luther Rice Seminary. He is director of uh, research for Atlanta Christian Apologetics Project and is also host of a uh, weekly talk show on the radio called Truth Talk. By the way, that's on Saturday morning, so he's, um, he's on earlier in the day. And he has published a book called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, uh, published by Baker Bookhouse. Rob, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing fine. Well, uh, let's start out the discussion by uh, if you could briefly tell us about the uh, Jehovah's Witness publication, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Uh, briefly, what is it saying? Well, the booklet is simply a compilation of standard Jehovah's Witness arguments against the doctrine of the Trinity, 
It claims that the doctrine of the Trinity was uh, originated centuries after the New Testament. Uh, it claims that the church that developed the doctrine of the Trinity did so on the basis of pagan religion and philosophy. It claims that the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be substantiated from either the Old or New Testaments, as Christians traditionally call them, uh, that the New Testament does not teach that Jesus is God, does not teach that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, and it presents the Jehovah's Witness uh, standard view on the nature of God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, which, very briefly, is that there is one divine person, ultimately, who is uh, uh, Jehovah, the Almighty God, the Father. He alone is the Almighty God. The Son and the Holy Spirit are not Almighty God. They are not Jehovah or Yahweh. And they are not to be regarded as the Creator, and they are not to receive worship. This solitary person called Jehovah created the Son, uh, Jesus Christ, as he is now known. But he created a Son uh, the, called the Word, or Michael the Archangel, and then empowered this uh, super being, this super angel, uh, or archangel, to make the universe with God's power. In other words, Jesus was uh, God, or Jehovah God, was the master contractor, and Jesus was the subcontractor in creation. Or, as the, the booklet itself uh, puts it, uh, Jesus, God is the senior partner, and Jesus is the junior partner in creation. Then the Holy Spirit, which is usually just called Holy Spirit uh, by Jehovah's Witnesses, Holy Spirit is not a person, divine or otherwise, but is a force or energy that emanates from God or that God is uh, an aspect of God's being. They're not really clear, really, on what Holy Spirit is in their thinking. But uh, Holy Spirit is a force that emanates from God, an active force uh, that he uses to get uh, his uh, creative work done and to do whatever he does, including to know what's going on in the world and to uh, do whatever it is that he wants to do in the world. So that is their view of Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. And uh, since this is such a radically different view from the traditional Christian view of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, they have uh, worked very hard to try to explain away a host of biblical references that support the uh, Trinitarian view of God, and also tried to dredge up quotations that they thought would substantiate their claim that the doctrine of the Trinity is not in the Bible, that it was developed late in church history. In fact, they try to push the Doctrine of Trinity off to about the 8th century, believe it or not. Hmm. And uh, their claim is uh, that they have scholarship behind them. One of the interesting things about it, though, is that their quotations, both from the early church writers and from modern scholars trying to buttress their doctrine, these quotations are almost, without exception, taken out of context to make the author mean in many cases, virtually the opposite of what he originally said. And at least one or two of the quotations appear to have been made up by somebody, not necessarily by the Watchtower, because they may have gotten them from somebody else, but they're not quotations from the writers at all. You can't find them. <laughs> hmm. uh, so that's, that's a little bit about the booklet. It's about 32 pages long or something like that. And so when that booklet came out, I responded to it with a uh, book called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. It's about 150 pages long. And it presents a blow-by-blow, point-by-point answer to the Jehovah's Witness booklet. Uh, backing up a little bit, it seems from what you're saying that uh, in answer to the age-old question, was Jesus Christ uh, man or God, the Jehovah's Witnesses would seem to say neither. Well, in the Jehovah's Witness thinking, really you could argue there have been three Jesus Christs. There was an angelic creature who existed uh, before the physical universe, before any of the other angels, but who is not God. This uh, super angel called Michael, called the Word, uh, was an angel, and he was a God with a little g, but he was not God, he was not the same kind of God as Almighty God, and he was definitely inferior to God and su subject to God as any creature would be. Then uh, Jesus' life force the, uh, some, the spiritual energy uh, or spiritual stuff that composed Jesus' uh, spirit body, as the Jehovah's Witnesses think of it, that life force was transferred into uh, the, uh, 
the infant, or rather the, the preconceived Jesus, uh, pre, pre-born Jesus in Mary's womb, and made into, transferred into the life of an ordinary human being. So according to Jehovah's Witnesses, from the moment of Jesus' conception in the womb of Mary until his death on the cross, Jesus was a man, no more, no less, a mere man, a perfect man, but a mere man. He was not God incarnate. He was not an angel incarnate. Uh, he was just a man. Then, in Jehovah's Witness, that's Jesus number two. Hmm. All right, then, uh, and in fact, I say Jesus number two because in order for Jesus to become a man, his, the person, the angelic person of the Word, or Michael, had to be essentially annihilated and the life force transferred into uh, this mere human being. Then Jesus, number two, was annihilated when he died on the cross. His physical body was dead. The person in Jehovah's Witness thinking, that, uh, when a person dies, when a human being dies, that person ceases to exist. Okay, we're speaking uh, this evening with Rob Bowman about Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, I've heard it said in sec- uh, secular circles that if we could, or that we could save a fortune on the national budget if while the Jehovah's Witnesses were out on the rounds, we could just get them to deliver the mail. Uh, whatever anyone says about this group, what everybody agrees on is that they are very, very prolific. And uh, if there's anything more prolific than the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's their literature. And we're talking about something that, what did you say, five million copies in its first printing? Five million in its first printing. Okay, and this is a, a little uh, booklet uh, entitled, Should You Believe in the Trinity? And very... Uh, uh, very strongly sets forth the Jehovah's Witness view that Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh and that the Trinity is uh, demonic doctrine. And we are speaking with Rob Bowman Jr. who has written a book responding to this called Why Should You Believe in the Trinity? It's published by Baker Bookhouse. I would very strongly recommend that you uh, get a copy of this. Uh, Rob, something I was going to mention. I noticed that Uh, In the introduction to your book, you you mentioned that the book is not an exhaustive discussion of the Trinity. It's it's basically talking about the Trinity in reference to uh, what's been said in this uh, publication by the Jehovah's Witnesses. In other words, it's it's defending the Trinity against the charges that are made in this publication, but it's not a big, thick theological work dealing with every aspect of the Trinity. That's right. By the way, let me mention that... uh uh, although the, the Jehovah's Witness booklet has uh, apparently been disseminated in the millions, uh, there's only uh, there's less than 30,000 copies of uh, my response out there. So we've got a lot of work to do to get the word out we here. We certainly do. Yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, that's right. If I had tried to, to do an exhaustive study on the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, it would, I'd still be working on it. Uh, the the uh, interesting part about this is my book came out six months was it six months? I think it was actually a little less than six months, about four or five months after the Watchtower booklet did. Uh, that's uh, kind of like record time for getting mm-hmm. a response out in, in print, in a book form. And uh, I wanted to get this out into people's hands quickly that would give them simple, uh, as non-technical as possible, answers to the Jehovah's Witnesses' uh, misinterpretations and misrepresentations of Christian scholarship and beliefs. And uh, so, yeah, it does... It, now, the interesting thing is, although it's a very pointed answer to Jehovah's Witnesses, the subtitle is An Answer to Jehovah's Witnesses. I've had letters from Mormons who read the book. I've had letters from Oneness Pentecostals. I've had letters from all kinds of people uh, outside of the Jehovah's Witness religion who were interested enough in the doctrine of the Trinity, wanted to know why anybody would believe it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and who picked up the book and read it and then wrote to me and many times to argue with me uh, but to sometimes say, hey, you made some good points, and I'll uh, think about this. Uh, so it's having an impact outside the Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, as you may know, Jehovah's Witnesses are not supposed to read books like this, although they do. Uh, but I haven't received too many letters from Jehovah's Witnesses because they're really not supposed to read these things in the first mm. place. Right, they have to read them in secret. But I've had Christians who wrote to me and said that they read the Watchtower booklet and they were terribly confused and shaken, and then they found out about my book and they read it, said, oh, uh, I can't believe in the Trinity. It is a biblical doctrine. Hmm. I, really, I really feel that, that that was the main reason for the book. I didn't want Christians reading the Watchtower booklet saying, gee, there's no answer to this. Yeah. And I would like to go through the arguments that you make uh, systematically one at a time, and I'd like to start with uh, a definition of the Trinity that will 
uh, clarify the common misunderstandings. Uh, quite often, the arguments against the Trinity are actually parodies of, of what uh, we as uh, believers hold to. And I would like for you to start out by giving just a definition of the a Trinity that will clarify what we are, in fact, saying. Yes, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, holds that there is one God, one divine being, uh, who exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not simply three different uh, functions or three different titles or three different attributes of God, but somehow three distinguishable ways in which God is God, uh, that, that these three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, speak to one another, uh, that they, in fact, uh, love one another, that they know each one another. Uh, we, we read in the New Testament that Jesus uh, was sent by the Father and went back to heaven to the Father and then sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would not speak on his own initiative, but would only say what he was told to say. And uh, all of this, you know, personal language about the relationships among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the doctrine of the Trinity simply maintains we don't have three gods, which is a common misperception. We don't have one divine being who simply wears three different hats, but we have one divine being, one God, who eternally exists in the, this threefold way as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's basically the doctrine of the Trinity. I have heard people attempt to, to make illustrations and analogies dealing with this, and I was wanted to ask you what your opinion was on, on analogies like uh, water. Water is, you can talk about water as ice, you can talk about it as, as a vapor, you can talk about it as a liquid. Is, is that at all a, a, an accurate analogy? It's not a very good analogy in my opinion. It uh, better supports a kind of a modalistic view of God, and again the idea that God can take three different forms or that God can manifest himself in three different ways from time to time. Now, I know some people have developed a very sophisticated version of this argument based on something called the triple point. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't care to go into all that, but the biggest problem with it is, uh, there's several problems with it, but maybe the biggest problem of it is that uh, you're dealing with impersonal realities to begin with. Water, steam, and ice are all impersonal. They're mm -hmm. all it. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not it. Uh, they're, they're, the, the Father is a who. Uh, not an it. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he is referred to as he. Uh, he is a person. And so, now, uh, some people have gone to, an, uh, tried another uh, analogy that says, well, uh, you know, I'm a father to my children, I'm a husband to my wife, and I'm a son to my own father. That also is not a good illustration, because those are three different roles that one person plays in relationship to other people. But what we're, uh, what we're saying here is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coexist within mm. the divine being somehow. Mm. Now, nobody who believes in this doctrine claims that they have a full comprehension of it, uh, nor do we claim that it's just uh, that it's a mystery in the sense of being pure nonsense and uh, totally unintelligible. We just believe in it, even though we haven't got a clue what we're saying. It's something in between. It's, it's um, paradoxical, uh, it's beyond our total comprehension, but we can have a basic understanding of the importance and the significance of this idea. And the significance of this idea is, very simply, that the God who made the universe is the same God who came to redeem us from our sins in Jesus Christ, and is the same God who indwells the believer uh, in the person of the Holy Spirit, and so that God is responsible solely responsible for our existence and for our salvation. And any non-Trinitarian views invariably either deny this outright or confuse it hopelessly and end up assigning a significant aspect of the responsibility for our existence and or our salvation to creatures. Jehovah's Witness is a classic case in point. Jehovah's Witness thinking God doesn't make the universe, God makes a super angel and gives him the power to make the universe, God doesn't come in human form to save us. He sends an angel, uh, making him into a mere human being, and a mere human being does the dirty work of saving us, although he doesn't, do all, he doesn't completely save us. We have to do our bit. Mm -hmm. God does his bit. Jesus does his bit. We do our bit, and together we'll all get the job done. That's completely different from the biblical view, which is that God made us, 
God redeems us, God saves us, God is coming back for us, God, God, God. That's the biblical view. That also, That's what the doctrine of the Trinity upholds. That almost sounds like uh, Islam with God being transcendent and sending uh, Muhammad to come and uh, be his prophet. Well, that's an interesting point, because all non-Trinitarian views of God end up making God unknowable. Uh, God, or they end up dragging d God down into a human form. God is either uh, so transcendent mm -hmm. that he's just a big mystery. He's just a big question mark. And that's the way God is in Islam. Uh, and the opposite extreme is, say, in Mormonism, where God's just like you and me, he's just further along in his evolution. He's mm -hmm. further along in his progression. Uh, he's attained godhood. We haven't yet, but we're fundamentally the same kind of beings. And he still has his body of flesh and bones and all the rest of it. So the non-Trinitarian theologies have a very difficult time balancing the transcendence of God, the fact that God is beyond the creature, and the imminence of God, the, the knowability of God, the, the closeness and intimacy of God. Mm -hmm. Only Trinitarians believe in a God who is fully transcendent and yet fully imminent. Before we run out of time, I want to start getting into the uh, uh, the Bible arguments for this particular, uh, for the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, so what does the Bible say about it? Is the word Trinity in the Bible? <laughs> no, the word T-R-I-N-I-T-Y is not in the Bible, but then neither is the word B-I-B-L-E. Uh, the word <laughs> right. Bible isn't in the Bible, but we believe in the Bible. <laughs> it's a biblical concept, that is, that there is a unified uh, corpus of literature that we can call the Bible and uh, we can talk about it. The, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but there are hundreds of biblical references that support it, and uh, we only have a little bit of time. We haven't even taken any uh, calls. I don't know if there's anybody waiting to call in, but uh, basically the biblical doctrine of Trinity is, uh, is supported in, in just a few major points that could be made. First, that there is one God. The Bible says this over and over and over again. If people want some references, they can look at uh, Deuteronomy uh, 6, four. Isaiah 43, verse 10, Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 8, John 17, 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6, James 2, 19, and boy, we could go on and on. I'm, I'm being very selective. Mm -hmm. Many, many verses in the Old and New Testament say there's only one God. Second point is that this one God eternally is the Father, that the Father is God, the Father is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator of the universe. He is eternal. He is absolute being. Okay, so the Father is God. Third, and we don't really, for most people, we don't have to prove that. They generally admit that. And of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses do. The third point is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is himself God, that he is absolute, almighty, eternal deity. The Bible supports this in several ways. It tells us that he existed before all things in Colossians 1.17. Uh, that he was already there in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. It tells us that he is God. It actually calls him God without any kind of qualification in the context that would make him a mere creature. It does this in John 1.1, 1, 1, John 20.28, 20, Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and again, we could go on and on. It also calls, and this is very interesting for Jehovah's Witnesses to hear, it also calls Jesus Lord, where in the context, the word Lord is a translation of the Old Testament term Yahweh, or Jehovah. Mm -hmm. it, it does this, for example, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 13, where Joel 2.32 is quoted in the punchline of verse 13 and applied to Jesus Christ, although Joel 2.32 refers to the Lord Jehovah. It does this again in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, which says that Jesus has the name which is above every name, and then says that that name is Lord. That mm -hmm. is, of course, Jehovah, and it does it several other places. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus possesses all of the nature or attributes of God, that he is eternal, that he is all-powerful, uh, that everything God is, Jesus Christ is. The Bible also, and then the, the fourth point, I guess, would be that the Holy Spirit is a person who is God. The Holy Spirit is not revealed distinctly as a person until toward the end of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 14 to 16. And then throughout the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit operating as a person. We see him clearly revealing himself as a person. Uh, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as another comforter or another helper whom he would send from the Father after he went back to heaven. Of course, Jesus is the first comforter, and he, the second comforter is the Holy Spirit, so he's 
another person like Jesus who's going to come and take his place after he's gone to heaven. Hmm. This evening we are talking about Jehovah's Witnesses and a little publication you might have heard of simply called Should You Believe in the Trinity? Uh, and the response to that by Rob Bowman Jr., who is our guest this evening, Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. And when we left for the break, we were talking about uh, what the Bible has to say about the Trinity. And Rob, you were in the middle of saying what the Bible has to say about the Holy Spirit, that uh, Jesus Christ is, uh, uh, is the Comforter and He has gone back to the Father so that He may send another Comforter. That's right. That, you find that in John chapter 14, for example, in verse 16. And uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, according to the New Testament, uh, especially in John 14 to 16, we find that she, the Holy Spirit is sent in Jesus' name. He teaches. He bears witness to Jesus. He speaks not on his own initiative, but he speaks whatever the Son says to him. Uh, he, that's in John chapter 16, verses 13 to 14. So the Holy Spirit is humble. Uh, like Jesus, uh, who did not speak on his own initiative, but spoke whatever the Father said, the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own initiative, but he says whatever Jesus tells him to say. Now, well, clearly the Holy Spirit is being presented there as a person. Uh, throughout the book of Acts, we find the Holy Spirit speaking to people, guiding them, uh, directing them, calling people into ministry. We find even the Holy Spirit thinking alongside the disciples uh, in Acts 15, uh, 29, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, and the, the apostles think it good uh, that certain uh, points be made uh, to the Gentile believers. So the Holy Spirit thinks. The Holy Spirit speaks in the first person singular, calling himself I. Uh, the Holy Spirit can be lied to, Acts 5, verse 3. Uh, you know, there's just so much evidence that the Holy Spirit is a person. And uh, so since he's a divine person, He's not a created person. Even Jehovah's Witnesses will admit he, he, he's not created. Uh, then he's a divine person, but there's only one divine being. And so that, once again, we have a divine person other than the Father who is eternally uh, God. So now we have three such persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are mentioned together in the same context over 60 times in the New Testament, or perhaps most famously, uh, Matthew 28:19, where Jesus tells the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, the significance of that is not merely that all three are mentioned together, although that's significant enough, mm -hmm. but that Jesus refers to them being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father and Son are persons, of course. Obviously, that would imply that the Holy Spirit is also a person. Mm -hmm. And the three there are not just half don't just happen to be mentioned in the same context, but in the context of identifying yourself, your religious commitment is to the Father, it's to the Son, and it's to the Holy Spirit. So there's, a, in other words, there's an implied there that all three of those persons are fully God, that they are the object of faith and devotion and worship on the part of the Christian disciple. So all of this together comes down to this, that we have one God, uh, one divine being who speaks in the first person singular throughout the Old Testament, and this one divine being, this one God named Yahweh or Jehovah, reveals himself in the New Testament to exist eternally as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. Going back to Acts chapter 5 right quick, uh, not only does it say that the Holy Spirit can be lied to, but in verse 4, uh, Peter told Ananias that you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God himself. That's right, and that does uh, imply that for Peter, lying to the Holy Spirit was the same thing as lying to God, and that, that tends to support the idea that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is called the Lord, uh, and in the context of clearly the Lord Jehovah, in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. And again, Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a choice here. If the Holy Spirit is a person, the gig is up, because he's not a created person, because God can't do anything apart from his Holy Spirit. But that's, of course, nonsense if the Holy Spirit is a creature. Hmm. So he has to be either a divine force that emanates from God, or a divine person. Those are the only two choices for the Jehovah's Witnesses. 447-KIXL, 447-5495. We're quickly running out of ta uh, time. We want to talk to James. James, you're on the air. What can we do for you? Yeah, good evening, everybody. I just wanted to share with you that the uh, last dialogue I had with a Jehovah's Witness, uh, 
on our first meeting, I gave him a copy of Ron Bowman's, uh, uh, Bob Bowman's uh, booklet on the outline of the Trinity, and he took it and he uh, pretty much uh, thoroughly studied it. I told him it wasn't fair of him to condemn something he didn't understand. So he took it before I, he gave me anything. I had that in his hands. Yes, James, you were saying that you had given a copy of Rob's outline, Study of the Trinity, to a Jehovah's Witness. Um, have you heard anything back from the gentleman? Uh, there were a couple of things that he didn't quite understand, but uh, as I said, he showed a great deal of interest, and I uh, helped him along. But, can, you, uh, can you speak up a little bit, James, please? We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. I just wanted to say that he took it and he studied it. Okay. And uh, it had some positive effects. Okay. And... One other thing real quick, and I'll get off this week line, I guess. Uh, I've got your book, uh, Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, but I wish that you had have included in the bibliography uh, the volume and page numbers from the ANF that the Watchtower used in their booklet to show the spurious quotes. I went down to the local seminary library, and I got the good quotes, but I wished I had have been able to get the bad ones. They looked it out of context. Okay, thank you very much, James. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I was going to mention uh, real briefly that I believe this outline of the Trinity that James mentions has like 700 uh, biblical references to the Trinity in it. That's right. I'm currently working on revising it. I think eventually it'll have an even thousand, but already there are biblical references from 26 out of the 27 books of the New Testament and many references from the Old Testament as well. So this is a biblical doctrine. It's not based on one or two proof texts from one or two books of the Bible, but it's, it's a biblical teaching. Now, one of the things I, f I found interesting, I've been sitting here looking through their booklet, uh, Should You Believe in the Trinity, and out of all of the, source, the sources that they quote, I haven't been able to find any footnotes. I haven't they, been able to find a reference to what page the book was on, right. any of the quotes or anything. They, they did, uh, I think, make a kind of a mistake there because it, it's, they've been criticized for that. And I noticed in more recent publications that they've included footnotes and I have been told that it is possible to write to the Watchtower and get a list of the footnotes. It's interesting, uh, at least some people who've done that, what they've gotten back when they asked for photocopies documenting these quotations, uh, from, especially from the early church fathers, mm -hmm. they didn't get pages from the anti-Nicene fathers' uh, uh, volumes. What they got were photocopies from a 19th century anti-Trinitarian book quoting this that they were that, in other words the research was based on a secondary source and at least one or two places what was being quoted was not actually not the church father himself but the 19th century anti-trinitarian by mistake <laughs> hmm. so yeah. that, that appears to have been the source for this uh collection of quotations in the watchtower booklet what's more accurate rendering of church history as far as its position on the trinity Briefly, we're, I hate to do this to you, we're running out of time, but I, I did want to get this in. Well, the early church uh, developed its understanding of God over a period of time. There was a lot of refinement through debate and discussion, uh, and especially in reaction to views which the church rightly judged to be completely off the wall. Uh, but the early church fathers uh, were uh, essentially Trinitarian, although not always consistently Trinitarian uh, judged in the light of the completed process of discussion. In other words, we're not saying that the doctrine of the Trinity as formulated in the creeds was, was in the possession of the Church in that formal, completely developed form from the get-go. What we're saying is the Church responded to completely unbiblical ideas by refining its language, its doctrine, by trying to express the Christian view in language that people would understand, and in the process, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, but basically they were able to uphold the same doctrine that the New Testament taught, that the second and third century church fathers taught, in a formal, systematic way that really clarified the issue uh, for centuries and centuries to come. So that's basically what they did. They weren't inspired in that. They were not, uh, their, their writings and the, the creeds are not inspired scripture, but they are uh, excellent testimonies to the early church's faith, and it was basically a Trinitarian faith, a belief in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it was that way from the very beginning. 
Okay, well, uh, Rob Bowman, thank you very much, and we're going to have you on the next hour to, uh, we're going to actually have a debate uh, with Joseph Malik, who is a former Jehovah's Witness, and we're going to be uh, debating a publication that he has put out. It's actually a, uh, a supplement to a publication that he put out, a book that he put out called uh, Beyond the Watchtower, and it has to do with uh, several disagreements that he has with that organization. Right, it's um, an, the story of his, his and his wife's exodus from the Watchtower organization. Mm -hmm. And he has got a supplement to that called Beyond Trinitarianism, and we will be uh, talking about that. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers, with a short postscript to part one of this particular show with our outstanding guest, Robert Bowman Jr. I would just like to reiterate the value of Robert Bowman's excellent book, why You Should Believe the Trinity, available from Baker Bookhouse, Grand Rapids, Michigan. This book should be in every Christian apologist library. It not only refutes biblically the Jehovah's Witness arguments raised against the Trinity, but it exposes the deceptive and deceitful, quote, scholarship, end quote, employed by the Watchtower Society to mislead the unsuspecting. The following is a short excerpt from pages 37 and 38 of Bowman's book. Quote, All this raises an interesting question. Where, during the centuries following the New Testament era, were the ancient counterparts to today's Jehovah's Witnesses? According to the Witnesses, the Church fell into apostasy sometime after the Apostolic Era, and the truths of the Bible were restored only in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in their religion. If this is so, we would expect to find some record of a religious group in a second or third century with views resembling at least somewhat those of the Jehovah's Witnesses. But such is not the case. The closest parallel is the Aryan movement, but it did not exist until the 4th century. Robert Bowman goes on to state, quote, The Jehovah's Witness booklet contains a number of false or misleading assertions regarding the Council of Nicaea and the Roman Emperor Constantine's role in it. The booklet states that the Council, quote, did not establish the doctrine of the Trinity, for at that Council there was no mention of the Holy Spirit as the third person of a triune Godhead, in quote, page 7. While the Council did not define its view of the Holy Spirit, the Creed of Nicaea, not to be confused with the later work popularly known as the Nicene Creed, was Trinitarian in structure, quote, We believe in one God the Father, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, in quote. Nothing was said about the Holy Spirit simply because the subject of controversy was the person of the Son. Thus, the Council upheld a Trinitarian theology without elaborating on the person of the Holy Spirit. In conclusion, I'd like to say Robert Bowman backs up his case with excellent documentation and footnoting. This book will assist its owner to unconfuse those who have been led astray by the Jehovah's Witness booklet, Should You Believe the Trinity, which has been printed by the millions in scores of languages and dispensed throughout the world. The war with false prophets is ever raging. I urge our listeners to obtain this valuable resource. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Welcome back to the second hour of Christian Answers Live, an outreach of Christian Answers, a nationwide apologetics ministry dedicated to defending the Christian faith by providing Christian answers. And now, once again, from Austin, Texas, here are your hosts, Lee Meckley and Jim Tungate. I am Lee Meckley, the director of radio outreach for Christian Answers, along with Jim Tungate, who is our director of research and editor of the Christian Answers Journal. Last hour, we were talking about a Jehovah's Witness publication called Should You Believe in the Trinity? And this is a booklet that 
He emphatically states that Jesus Christ is not God and that the Trinity, which has been taught historically by all three divisions of uh, Christianity, that is Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, is a demonic doctrine. We were discussing this with our guest Rob Bowman, who has written a book uh, in response to that called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, published by Baker Bookhouse, that defends the doctrine of the Trinity. And this hour, uh, Rob will be defending the Trinity in a debate with Joseph Malik, who is a former Jehovah's Witness, and Mr. Malik will need to stress that he no longer holds to the uh, JW view of the Trinity and that the views that he will be presenting this hour are his own. Joseph Malik is author of a book called Beyond the Watchtower, and he's uh, published some supplements to that book, and one of those is called Beyond Trinitarianism. Uh, Joseph Malik, how are you uh, this evening? How do you do, Lee? Uh, just fine. And... Uh, we will go ahead and, uh, right after I introduce Rob Bowman, get started with the discussion tonight. Rob Bowman is um, host of a, another talk show on Saturdays called Truth Talk. He's also uh, the director of research for Atlanta Christian Apologetics Project and an instructor in apologetics and theology at Luther, Luther Rice Seminary. Uh, Rob, how are you doing this evening? <laughs> Doing fine. Welcome back to the second hour of Christian Answers Live. And having said all that, um, I'm rushing because we we ended up short on time, and I want to make sure we get all this in. Without any further ado, uh, Joseph Malik, uh, we'll go ahead and give you ten minutes to present your position. Fine. Uh, well, uh, the um, position that I hold is the, is the same position that is held in the Gospel of John. Because it was John who really explained to us in uh, detail the relationship between the, uh, God and the Son. Uh, we're familiar with, of course, with John 1.1, 1, 1, where it states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> and uh, the point, what is the point being made by John? Was John, was John teaching us that the Word was God and he was with God at the same time? Or is John teaching us that the Word was with God, but the Word was also God to man? <clears throat> Why would I say this? Because uh, ever since the, uh, the Bible was written and the Law of Moses was composed, the doctrine that, uh, of the office of God was clearly established. Uh, Moses became God to Pharaoh, and Moses also became God to Aaron, his brother. The uh, uh, um, teachers of Israel were, uh, and, and uh, prophets of Israel were, were God to the people of Israel. And our Lord can use this doctrine in his defense when, when the people of Israel thought that he was making himself God because he said, I and the Father were one. Um, he corrected them and said, well, even in the scriptures, which cannot be nullified, the scriptures teach that they are gods, because these human beings held an office of responsibility that was equivalent to the office of God. So he can use this mechanism in his defense and say, even if you think that way, you have no reason for stoning me. But because they were not able to grasp the implication of this, he clarified it and said, I am you know, God's Son. So we should not confuse, then, the office of God with the being of God. Because God is a being, not simply a person, but He is the I Am, the being. When Exodus 3.14 was translated into Greek, it was translated being, not I Am. So the being of God, who has a name of His own, should not be confused with the office of God, which is a position of responsibility that applies uh, to the Son as well as to man, who have, in, in fact, it even applied to Herod. Uh, when Herod did not acknowledge the fact the, that his office of responsibility came from God, he was stricken and he died because he did not acknowledge the fact that his office came from above. This is the reason, I, I feel, for the confusion that, that results in, in um, the faith today and why uh, the, the office of God and the being of God uh, and the Spirit uh, are, are combined together 
in order to form the Trinity doctrine. Uh, as far as the Spirit is concerned, uh, it, is, it is neither God nor a power, as, as many teach, but it is simply a biblical term and, and is used as a mechanism for teaching, as a teaching aid. By using the word spirit, we can project thoughts without using sentences, phrases, or paragraphs to present such thoughts. So the word spirit then becomes a variable in Scripture, and its meaning varies from Scripture to Scripture. We, we, uh, we can use the, the uh, material in the Scripture, we can focus on a message, and we can project what the word spirit means in that particular verse. So in one verse, it's truth. In another, it's a, a person speaking in behalf of the truth. In another verse, it is, it is God. In another verse, it's the way miracles are performed. And even people have spirit, a spirit re which returns to God at death. So the spirit itself is neither a person nor a being, but is a teaching aid. Uh, we know that the Father is God to man, but the but the uh, the Father is God to both Jesus and man. For Jesus said after his resurrection, "I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God." <clears throat> and another verse. And this is the life eternal in John 17, 3. They, they, they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Christ becomes a mediator between us and God. In Galatians 3, 20, we learn, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. <clears throat> For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2.5. So it's very clear then, to, uh, to me at least, that um, God and his Son, the Word, are separate and distinct beings. There are several verses in the Bible where they are called persons, but the Spirit is never identified as a person in Scripture, and the Spirit is never identified as a being in his own right, <clears throat> but it is used in various ways to convey the message, which translates, uh, trans, uh, sends uh, translation, and it and it translates, uh, it transcends um, uh, uh, our, our all thought. It's it's very difficult to corrupt scripture when we have a word that conveys meaning that can, cannot be tampered with, except perhaps for adding the word holy in front of it. The meaning is not altered by this, and, and the message is not altered by this, and, and, and it maintained the purity of the gospel. We have uh, Rob Bowman, who is author of the book, Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, published by Baker Bookhouse. And he is obviously taking the affirmative Trinitarian position, and he is debating Joseph Malik, who is a former Jehovah's Witness, and who has published a book called Beyond the Watchtower, and a supplement to that book is Beyond Trinitarianism. And again, Joseph Malik wanted me to stress that the views, he is not taking the traditional Jehovah's Witness view of the Trinity, or lacking thereof, but he, his views are his own, and we're going to be hearing more uh, about his views. Right now we're going to go to Rob Bowman, for a 10-minute uh, uh, presentation of his position. Rob, you have 10 minutes from right now. All right. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by asking uh, Mr. Malik when he comes back uh, into the discussion if he could explain how his view on the nature of God and Jesus and the Spirit uh, differs uh, substantially from the Jehovah's Witness view. I think the only way in which he's made his view sound at all different from the uh, Jehovah's Witness view is that he says that the Spirit is not a power, which I guess is the way he's characterizing the Jehovah's Witness view, but really it doesn't make too much difference because in his view there is no uh, third divine person called the Holy Spirit who can be distinguished from the Father or the Son. So it sounds like his view is basically the same and perhaps he has a different semantical understanding of certain biblical passages referring to the Holy Spirit. Let me uh, just very briefly explain 
uh, why I do believe in the Trinity in contrast uh, to what Mr. Malik has uh, stated. First of all, the Bible clearly teaches that there's only one God, and this is uh, very much the foundation uh, platform for the doctrine of the Trinity. And Mr. Malik distinguishes between uh, the being of God, which he says there's only one uh, being uh, of God, and the office of God, which apparently can be held by a number of creatures. Now, the word God uh, is perhaps used in a few references uh, in the Old Testament, uh, perhaps Psalm 82, and maybe a couple of other places. I don't think very many, if any at all, uh, to, in a completely non-religious sense of creatures that exhibit some kind of uh, power of life and death over human beings or something like that. But uh, these are completely irrelevant uh, to the point because the Bible does not distinguish between the being of God and the office of God. It simply says over and over again, there's only one God. It doesn't say there are many beings, uh, there are many creatures that are gods, uh, but only one who is the being of God. And no such distinctions ever introduced uh, into uh, the Bible. In fact, if we ask, well, in terms of office or position or role, what is a god in the Bible? A god is someone who creates the universe. That's part of what it means to hold the office of God. Uh, a, a god is someone who presides over the universe, who rules over the universe. Uh, a god is someone who saves human beings when they uh, fall into sin, uh, to, whom the, to whom people ought to turn for forgiveness and redemption. Uh, that's a god. Uh, a, a, being, a god is someone that a person, a human being, ought to worship, ought to adore, ought to love and obey unconditionally. Uh, that's a god. And these official functions of a god are consistently ascribed only to the Lord God Almighty uh, in the Bible. No, none of these functions are ever ascribed to creatures. Now, creatures can, of course... Uh, save people politically. Uh, creatures can uh, become military leaders and, and deliver the Israelites from political disaster. But in terms of saving them spiritually or saving them from their sins, this is a, a function of deity. It's never ascribed to creatures. And so these official capacities of deity or godness, godhood, are limited to one and only one being in the Old Testament, and that's Jehovah. Yet Jesus Christ is given all of these uh, official functions in the New Testament. He is to be worshipped, he is to be adored, loved, obeyed unconditionally. He is regarded as the Creator, he is regarded as the Savior, with a capital S, if you will, the Savior. And so all of the official capacities of deity that are ascribed exclusively to Jehovah in the Old Testament are ascribed to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Now John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, which was cited by Mr. Malik, uh, simply contradicts his position emphatically. Uh, Mr. Malik says John 1.1 1, 1 means that the Word was not the being of God, but he was God to man. Now, a simple reading of John chapter 1, verse 1, will prove that false, because it, what it says is, in the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, the Word was God in the beginning, in the beginning of time, at the beginning of time, in the beginning of history, before there were any human beings. Now, it's kind of hard to hold the office of being a god over men if men don't exist. In fact, no, according to the standard Jehovah's Witness view of Jesus Christ, which Mr. Malik appears to still hold, Jesus was created by God and existed as the only creature for some period of time. And then, at some time after Jesus was created, God uh, gave him the power to create everything else. So during that period of time, in the beginning... Jesus could not be a god over anything or anybody because nothing else existed for him to be a god over. So clearly then, if Jesus is God and holds all the prerogatives of God, then he is God Almighty because there's only one of them in the Bible. Finally, let me say something about the meaning of the word spirit. Uh, I don't really understand Mr. Malik's explanation. I've read it in his manuscript on uh, Beyond Trinitarianism. I still don't think it makes much sense. Throughout the Bible, the word spirit is customarily used uh, to refer to a variety of persons. God is a spirit. Of course, God is a person. The angels are spirits. Of course, the angels are persons. Human beings, when they die, are referred to as spirits. Of course, human beings are persons. The demons are unholy or wicked spirits, unclean spirits. They are persons. 
In fact, the Holy Spirit is contrasted with the unholy spirits or the demonic spirits in the New Testament. For example, in Mark 3, verses 29 and 30, where Jesus says, I'm not casting out uh, Satan by a demon, an unholy spirit. I'm casting him out by the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit there is a, de- a spirit person in contrast to the unholy spirit persons that he was accused of being possessed by. You see the same contrast in 1 Timothy 4, 1, and 1 John chapter 3, uh, ver- uh, verse 24 through chapter 4, uh, verse 6. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a spirit person contrasted in the Bible to the unholy spirits that possess uh, certain wicked people. And this Holy Spirit, consistently through John chapters 14, 15, and 16, is presented as a person that God would send from heaven, that God did send from heaven after Jesus, another person, went back to heaven uh, at the ascension. And so very briefly then, the Holy Spirit is a person. The word spirit, the word may be used in other ways, in other contexts, but when the Spirit is spoken of in this fashion, as someone who is sent by the Father or sent by the Son out of heaven, down to the earth after Jesus went up to heaven, he is clearly being spoken of as a distinct person. And this spirit person, of course, is nothing less than God. So that's the basis for the doctrine of the Trinity. It's a biblical teaching. It's not a confusion of the Bible. And it's something that Bible-believing Christians have maintained for almost two millennia. Lee Meckley along with Jim Tungate, and we're having a little debate this hour on the Trinity. Uh, the participants are Rob Bowman, who is author of Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, uh, published by Baker Bookhouse, and also Joseph Malik, who is author of a book, uh, Beyond the Watchtower, in which he talks about his exodus from the Watchtower. And a uh, supplement to that uh, book is Beyond Trinitarianism, which he talks about his particular view on the Trinity, and at this time we're going to give uh, Mr. Malik five minutes to uh, give a rebuttal to Rob Bowman's position. Mr. Malik, you have five minutes from right now. Thank you, Lee. Uh, returning to John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, we learned that the Word was with God. In other words, John was saying that the Word was not God himself, but he was with God, and he confirms this in the next verse, which states, the same was in the beginning with God. Now, the, the denying the office of God, uh, in, as it is uh, taught in Scripture, simply because it only occurs in a few verses of the Old Testament, uh, does not prove that it is not true a true doctrine. Our Lord did, after all, use it in his defense and carry this doctrine into the New Testament and made it a part of the faith. So we cannot deny the office of God. In fact, uh, the use of this uh, uh, office uh, was our Lord's defense in in saving his life. Now, it's true, then, because there is such a thing as an office of God, that attributes of God are transferable. God can transfer his attributes to the Son, and the Son can take up a position that is equal or equivalent to that of God, in that he can create living things, he can create mankind, and when he came into the world which was made by him, this world did not recognize him. The Son learns from his Father. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. So the son learns and copies the things that his father shows him. Uh, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he he sent me, John 8, 42. And... As the Father raiseth up the dead, which, uh, which he did in the Old Testament, and quicketh them, even so the Son quicketh whom he will. So such attributes and such qualities and such ability are transferable to the Son. Even titles are transferable and can be given as an inheritance to the Son. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5.22. That was 5.21 and 22. Uh, John 3.35, the Father loveth the Son and hath given, now transferred, given all things into his hand. So 
the, the teaching is clear. The son is a being, an entity in his own right, who, who is given the position of God to man. And the father, the, 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 the I am, is a being in his own right. And the two are not one God, but one is, the, one is true God, and the other holds the office of God. If we examine the word true God, we find that it only appears in a few verses, and the, uh, when the word true is placed in front of the word God, it has specific application and applies only to the Father. <clears throat> now, as far as the um, spirit being a person, it could be used in many ways, and is not restricted in the way it can be applied. It can be a person, it can be our personality, it could be the way miracles are performed. If a study of the word spirit is done in every instance of its use, examined, we will find that it is not a person each time. It can be applied to the, to the faith itself. The faith itself is spirit. It is a body of Christ. It is an entity in its own right. It is called a slave, it could be a faithful slave, it could be an evil slave. So the spirit can be used to describe the faith or describe different attributes of God or used as a teaching aid. And so uh, it simply, simply denying the fact that the office of God exists, you know, it does not uh, prove that uh, the Trinity doctrine is the only other alternative. Okay, uh, Mr. Malik, thank you very much. And now, uh, Rob Bowman, you have five minutes for your rebuttal from right now. Yes. Let's go back to John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Joseph Malik says, The fact that we are told that the Word was with God proves that he wasn't the same being as God. Now, in a, a sense, although my terminology would be a little bit different, I would agree with him. The Word was not the same person as the person called God with whom he existed in the beginning. That's always been the belief of Trinitarians, though. We have always distinguished between God the Father, with whom Jesus existed in the beginning, and God the Son, or Jesus Christ, the Eternal Son, who existed alongside the Father, with the Father, from the beginning. So we, we've always acknowledged that distinction, but we have not taken it to mean that the Word, or Jesus Christ, is a second God, or a second being, uh, separate uh, in nature and being from, from God, and existing as a creature, uh, rather than the Creator. So uh, there's a half-truth from our perspective in what he was saying in that verse. But again, I'd go back to the point I made, which really has, hasn't been answered, and that is in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was God at the very beginning of time, and yet there were no creatures, other creatures, for him to be God over. So it can't be referring to a mere office that he held over other creatures, because there weren't any other creatures for him to be a God over. Now, Mr. Malik is absolutely right, just because there's only a few verses that use the word God in a certain, w certain way doesn't invalidate the point. Uh, that's that's fine. I agree with that. But the point, though, that these verses make, like Psalm 82, which is the main one that Mr. Malik is, is uh, emphasizing, which Jesus quotes in John 10, is not establishing a doctrine of an office of deity or an office of God. Rather, Psalm 82, if one reads it in context, is referring to the wicked judges in Israel as false gods, as creatures who thought of themselves as gods, and whom the true God calls before him to judge them and to show that they are not uh, truly God at all. Jesus Christ contrasts himself with these gods in John 10. Jesus is not saying, I'm the same kind of gods, God as the gods of Psalm 82. We can think of several very easy to understand differences between Jesus Christ and those so-called gods. Jesus Christ is not merely a God over certain creatures. He's the God over the entire universe. He has all authority over heaven and earth. But Jesus Christ, unlike these creatures, is eternal. Jesus Christ, unlike these creatures, is to receive worship. Jesus Christ, unlike these creatures, can be prayed to. Uh, and we could go on and on. Scripture makes it quite clear that Jesus is a different kind of God uh, than the judges of Psalm 82. Now, Mr. Malik says the attributes of God can be transferable. God can transfer attributes to the Son. Well, 
according to the Bible, the Son and the Holy Spirit are the only persons that God's attributes are possessed by in the, in the sense of the absolute attributes of God that make God God. And Jesus has all of the attributes of God. Colossians 2.9 says that all the fullness of the divine nature, or the, the deity, dwells in Christ bodily. Now that's all, not some, all. That means if God has a, an attribute, a characteristic, Jesus shares that characteristic. So if God is eternal, Jesus is eternal. If God is all-powerful, Jesus is all-powerful. You can't say Jesus gets all the attributes of God and then say he's a creature. It just doesn't make sense. Now, uh, Mr. Malik has brought up the I am a couple of times, so let me quote John 8, 24 and 28, which we began the program with almost two hours ago. John 8, 24, Jesus said, I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And he says something very similar in verse 28. Well, this is virtually a, par this is a paraphrase, really, of what Jehovah says in Isaiah 43, verse 10 where Jehovah says, You are my witnesses, declares Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. And in the Greek translation of Isaiah, it's the same Greek words, ego, ami, that I am, exactly as we find in John 8, verses 24 and 28. So Jesus, throughout John chapter 8, echoes the words of God, Jehovah, in Isaiah, and this is just one example. So finally, I would just say about the spirit once again, that yes, I agree the word spirit can be used in a variety of senses. The word pneuma in Greek, after all, can be translated wind or breath or spirit. But apparently Mr. Malik says it can be used in all kinds of senses, but it can't mean, it can never be used to mean a person who is a divine person distinguished from the Father. And yet that is the, the sense in which we find the word being used in John chapters 14 through 16 okay, Rob, uh, and in several passages in Acts. Okay, that's your five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a little bit of extra time here, so we're going to toss in a question from our hosts and give both of these gentlemen two minutes, to, two minutes each to respond uh, to that question. Okay, first I wanted to thank both of our guests today for being on the program. And... My question is, given the fact that it is pro proof beyond the shadow of a doubt in Scripture that God is an invisible spirit that no man has ever seen, I wanted to have both of the gentlemen give me their exegetical, exegetical pers perspective on the book, book of Exodus chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. It says, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by my name God Almighty, but not by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. And Mr. Malik, what is your exegetical perspective on that verse? Um, I just brought it up on, on the screen. Uh, I am the Lord, or Jehovah, and I appeared unto Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, I was not known to them. <clears throat> Because the name was his name was uh, is not revealed uh, as as such until it was given at at Exodus um, was it three fifteen not three fourteen they they did not comprehend uh, uh, God the way that uh, uh, Moses would comprehend God and they were not privy to the miraculous works that would pre pre be performed through the nation of Israel, which would carry the covenant for salvation to the world for thousands of years, uh, as it was, uh, as, as Abraham, who carried, who carried the message of, of faith. So uh, they did not understand or comprehend the Lord Jehovah the way that Moses and the nation, nation of Israel would comprehend him as he performed miracles in their behalf. It's, it's an entirely different way of dealing with people, the way he dealt with the nation of Israel and the way he dealt with Abraham. And the comprehension was very different between the two. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll go ahead and give Rob two minutes from right now to respond. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of questions, I think, uh, here in Exodus 6, uh, verses 2 and 3 that are being raised. The first question is... Uh, why is it that the Israelites, uh, Moses and Israelites, are said that they will know the name Yahweh or Jehovah, uh, and the uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, supposedly did not? And when you go back and read Genesis, you find Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob using the name Yahweh, 
And so that's led to some confusion. And very simply, I think my answer wouldn't be all that different from Mr. Malik's on this point, and that is to say that they, they knew the name, the label Yahweh. They used that. Uh, there appears to be pretty good evidence that they did, in fact, use the name Yahweh. But they didn't really understand the, the full significance of God as Yahweh, that that was his covenant name, and that Israel, through the Exodus event and all that would come after that, would come to fully appreciate God as Yahweh, as the sovereign Lord who is the self-existent and self-sufficient uh, sovereign God of the universe. So I think that's, that's basically what's going on there. Now, the other question, of course, is you raised specifically the question, if God cannot be seen by men, John 1.18, how can God, Jehovah, say in Exodus 6, 3, that he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And my answer to that is that Jehovah God, in his eternal, infinite, divine being, cannot be seen by finite human eyes, but that he can and has, from time to time throughout the Old Testament history, manifested himself in visible form to human beings for the purpose of communicating with them. And he does that in the book of Genesis in several instances. Whenever he does it, it's kind of a mysterious and awesome and numinous experience. It's kind of mysterious how it always happens. But, but nevertheless, God could do that. He did do that. Frequently, that manifestation of God in the Old Testament was called the angel of Yahweh, which appears to be a very shadowy reference to God himself appearing in physical or visible form. And from the New Testament, we gathered that visible manifestation of God was indeed the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to give each of you uh, two minutes for a closing argument, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Malik. You have uh, two minutes from right now to uh, give your closing argument. Uh, well, the, the thought that all the attributes of God uh, are present in the Son, and, and that proves that He is God, excuse me, um, are not borne out in Scripture in that the day and the hour is not known by this, this Holy Spirit or the Son. For in Mark 13, 32 it states, But that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So the Son is not all-knowing, the, the, the Spirit is not mentioned at all, as, as having a part uh, in this, even though angels are. Notice that the Spirit is not, because the Spirit is not a person in Scripture, neither is it a being in Scripture, even though it may be used in this way in several verses. But only the Father is all-knowing, and, and, and uh, the fact that the Son has similar attributes does not prove that He is the same being or, as the Father. And as, as the uh, Spirit is never called a person in Scripture, but the Father and the Son are, uh, we, we have no foundational reason to believe that there are actually three persons existing in the being of God. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, both you gentlemen hold on the line. I need to get some information from you. Uh, Rob Bowman, uh, you have two minutes from right now to give your closing argument. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to respond to the uh, scripture that Mr. Malik quoted, Mark 13:32, I believe it is, where Jesus says, that No one knows the day or the hour, uh, not the angels in heaven, not even the Son, uh, but only the Father. This verse uh, does uh, say something about the lack of knowledge of the incarnate man, Jesus Christ, uh, who apparently in some fashion, in some sense, didn't know that. But you have to balance this statement with a text like John 16:30, where the disciples say uh, to Jesus, now we realize that you know everything. And uh, so you have this paradox in Scripture about Jesus Christ. On the one hand, he's eternal. Uh, he existed in the beginning. Uh, on the other hand, he is born. He becomes a man. Uh, on the one hand, God cannot die, yet Jesus Christ, the God-man, suffered physical death. The New Testament presents Jesus Christ as a paradoxical person. He has divine nature. He also has a human nature. As God, he knows everything. Uh, because, uh, by virtue of his human nature, though, he grew. He had to learn things. He didn't know everything in some sense. So that's a paradox in Scripture. And to simply deny one half of that equation uh, simply won't work because the Bible quite clearly says that all the fullness of the nature of God dwells in Jesus Christ in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. That's a strong 
statement as you can possibly get. John 1.1 1, 1 in the Revised English Bible is tra- paraphrased this way, what God was, the Word was. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have historically said that was a good translation, and I agree, it's a good paraphrase, and it tells us that whatever God is in his eternal nature, so was the Word Jesus, Jesus Christ. So I think these scriptures clearly show that, in fact, Jesus Christ is God, although as man there is that paradox. You've been listening to Christian Answers Live. We've been talking about the Trinity with Rob Bowman, author of Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, published by Baker Bookhouse, and Joseph Malik, author of Beyond Trinitarianism. Thank you for joining us for Christian Answers Live. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Christian Answers Live is an outreach of Christian Answers. If you would like more information on this program or any of the resources available from this nationwide ministry, our address is Christian Answers, Post Office Box 144441, Austin, Texas, 78714. That address once again is Post Office Box 144441, Austin, Texas, 78714. Or call us at 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 